The Archbishop of Burundi was one of the few African primates who attended the recent primates meeting of the Anglican Communion in Dublin. From there he came to London, where we met, and we discussed the situation in the Communion and also talked about the problems facing his own country of Burundi. Burundi is a, a country in Central of Africa, the Great Lakes region. It has on its eastern border Tanzania and on the way western border the, Repub the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a country which is uh, now in a post-conflict situation where after the agreement signed in Arusha between the government of that time and the rebel movements, we have engaged into a peace process. And for the moment, there are many who were refugees in Tanzania who have come back. And the forces who were fighting at that time have now joined to make one defense force of Burundi. Now, you've come here from the meeting of the primates in Dublin, and you were one of the few African bishops who did turn up. Would you describe yourself as an evangelical? I describe, I mean, I have never known any other thing except being evangelical, if we use, use those terms. The missionaries who came to Burundi and brought us the gospel took the Bible to be the foundation of our faith, and we are very evangelical. And that's where I am still stand, as an evangelical, biblical, bibli knowing that the God I know has revealed himself not only in nature, but also through the scriptures. And that's where I find the will of God when I address most of the ethical issues, moral issues that the Anglican Communion is taking. But we can, Burundi participated because of two reasons. One is that uh, the Anglican Communion is our communion. We have a share, we have a place in that communion. So after consulting the House of Bishops and other bishops in Africa, we say Burundi will be present. The second is that the Church of Bur Anglican Church of Burundi recognizes that there are problems within the communion. The communion, the communion even is broken, but we take the communion as a family. When children of the same family do not agree on any given issue or on a certain issues, you do not separate necessarily. You meet and discuss those issues, those differences when you are together. I know my brothers from Africa did not come, not because they don't like tech, but they did not come because some of the decisions taken in Arush in Dar es Salaam and Alexandria in Egypt were not implemented. For us in Burundi, we say that some decisions that take long time to implement, and the instruments that are, that are supposed to implement them has to be revisited, and we see their effectiveness. So we participate because the communion is our family. And of course, by tech, you mean the Episcopal Church the of Episcopal the US. The Episcopal Church of the US, yeah. And how did you find the leadership of the Archbishop of Canterbury during the meeting? Well, he has uh, lots of problems, and he has lots of issues on his shoulders. But I think he has wide shoulders to hold them. And did it grieve you that your brother bishops and archbishops were not there? No, I was saddened that they are not there, and we, uh, I missed their fellowship. I missed our solidarity because I'm part of them, and they're also part of our, of our church in, in Burundi. We are of the same beliefs, same understanding. So when we are together, it's really, there's warmth. So when uh, they are not there, I feel I'm missing something. To go back to Burundi, is there a religious aspect to the problems there? Happily enough, we know that religion has been causes of conflict in other parts of the world, but in Burundi we do not have uh, that aspect, and we pray that we, do not, we should not have it, because what we have suffered, what our people have suffered on ethnic ground is quite enough. Adding on religion will be a disaster. So we are praying that uh, the Catholics, which are in majority, the Protestants, and even the Muslims, we work together for the well-being of our population. Could you just tell me what the proportions are of Catholics, Protestants and Muslims in Burundi? Because of the ties we had in our past with, the, with France and Belgium, the Roman Catholics are in great majority. 
if we say 95% of the country, of the population, the 9 million population are Christians, then the Catholics have 65% of that. Then we have Anglicans, Pentecostals, Methodists, and Baptists as following. You have a very small minority of Islam, but as you know, it's one of the, the growing religion in the world. And is the Anglican community growing? Anglican community is growing. We have six dioceses for the moment, but when we visit the parishes and congregations, we see them growing, and we hope that it will grow more and more. But uh, the growth of any religious community, for me, will not only be in the numbers, that's a fact, but they should also grow in being transformed, in putting the values of the gospel into the li everyday life, in seeing that you're, in being sorry and really re-examining our, our attitudes of the loving your neighbor because we have found that has not been our practice and our behavior, our lives in the past. And how many of you are there? How many Anglicans are there? We approach one million. So 10% of the population, 15% will be Anglicans. Do you mostly practice? Do you most go to church? Oh yes, they come to church. All the churches on Sunday are packed. And during the week also, there are meetings throughout the week. So when you visit Burundi, and I hope you will visit it, uh, we are, we, yeah, they are active, active and practicing Anglicans. Of course, there are some who are nominal Anglicans, like anywhere else. But we are opening. We are building. That's one of the activities that we see in Burundi, new church buildings. As a senior African primate, what do you see as the way forward for the Anglican Communion? I would very strongly recommend that the covenant is our way forward. A covenant as something that would hold us together, that puts once again, clarifies our beliefs, a covenant not as an instrument of exclusion, but a covenant of saying this, this is our faith, this is our beliefs. So the covenant will be our way forward. Secondly, the way forward is really continue to understand the context in which we believe in, we live in, and know that Christ and culture, the gospel and culture have had that struggle throughout history but always the gospel is to transform the culture. Would you say that in our present world of conflict and uncertainty, that a strong Anglican communion is necessary more than ever to help people in troubled situations such as your own? I think the Anglican communion is well called at this particular time to be, would I say, a model, but an example of how we address our difficulties. The issues that are within the Anglican communion have come to understand that they are also in other denominations. They are part of our culture we live in. But I would like to quote Pope John II when he says that the church should work in such a way that the values of the gospel become our culture. So the values of the gospel is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And who is our neighbor? Is that person necessarily who does not look like you, who is the poor, and who does not necessarily think as you think. That's our neighbor. So God is calling us to love them. So if the Anglican church, the Anglican communion, could adhere to that calling of God, probably I think person I feel that would be a model. So we hope that uh, though a small country, 28,000 square kilometers, 9 million of inhabitants, 500 or half a million of people who have come back from uh, refugees from Tanzania, now are returnees and also engaging into rebuilding the country after being reintegrated. We hope Burundi will play its part in that region and will also contribute to the well-being, to the understanding and the collaboration and regional cooperation for economic development and social cohesion in the whole coherence in the whole region. Now, hundreds of thousands of civilians have died in the inter-ethnic and political strife, and that culminated in civil war in the 90s. And of course, Rwanda next door is better known because of what happened in 94. 
But in terms of suffering and instability, you share an unenviable parity, don't you? Well, that's something we do deplore in the international community, and we like, we appreciate your coming here to share what's happening in Burundi, so that Burundi will be really put on the map. And with Christian Aid, who is our partner in development, partnering with the Anglican Church of Burundi, we have been, a, been able to talk to members of parliament, talk to the members of uh, the Foreign Office and DFID, saying, insisting, bring the awareness that Burundi should not be forgotten. Burundi has its problems. Burundi had suffered, has a long period of suffering. Because Rwanda people focused because it was uh, a three months genocide and that was an atrocity. But Burundi has a history of more than 40 years of conflict. The wound is very deep. It will take us to reestablish reconciliation and it will take us also to recover. So it has not recovered yet. What's at the root of the, the wound? The roots of the wound are mainly ethnic. But I would say our ethnicity is given by God. I am what I am because God created me as I am. I cannot change it. But ethnicity, though it should be, is a diversity that God gave us, has been used to exclude, to despise, and also to access power. So, so the conflict was really mainly power and authority. And who have been the victims of the exclusion? I would say the Burundians have been the victims. But from the colonial period, a group of uh, the Burundi tribes, Tutsis, benefited from the relationship and working with the, the colonials. But after independence and those, the fathers of our independence were saying we are all Burundians. So people, there are people who have been using the ethnicity sensitivity to exclude the other, the two groups of Hutus and Tutsis, on one side Tutsis and Hutus. So I would say the Burundians are the ones who have suffered and who have got the consequences. And whenever there is war between those ethnic groups, the grassroots, the people in the villages are the ones who suffer most. They are the ones who are put into camps, they are the ones who are refugees, and so on. So that's why we're saying let's do all what is in our possibility to help Burundi and Burundians not to fall into a war again. And of the Hutus and the Tutsis, who is in control now? Who's dominant now? now after the Arusha agreement, there is uh, a shared power sharing system that was put in place. Of course, the Hutus are in majority. They are eight, I mean, they don't, people have not counted, but they say they are 80% or 85% of the population. But what is a fact is that uh, there are more Hutus than Tutsis. So if you, ca you count on numbers, and for me, I will not insist on numbers. I will insist on the quality of the life, the quality of governance. So the Hutus will be in, in majority in every position. Now, recently, um, Ban Ki-moon, um, UN Secretary General, um, has downsized the U UN presence in Burundi. And Ban has voiced concern over signs of a returning climate of impunity, the resurgence of acts of torture, intimidation, extrajudicial executions, and arrests of opposition members. Who, are which, from which tribe do the, is being most victimized by the acts of torture and intimidation? No, I think they are both. They, I mean, the, 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 the present situation and what the 2010 elections showed us, it was not really on a basis of ethnicity. There were opposition leaders from both sides, from both ethnic groups, and I think that's where the Burundi is really changing and deeply changing, that the ethnic sensitivity is no longer being used as uh, something for exclusion. But I would like to comment on the action of, of Ban Ki-moon of uh, downside scaling the, the presence of the UN in Burundi. Seems an extraordinary thing to do at a time at when this, you need it there this, more, more than ever. At this particular time, I think it's a misjudgment of what Burundi and where Burundi is, where we need more presence, more support, and when we are engaged in the recovery. We do see killings here and there. 
extrajudicially and so on. And the government, I think, is very much involved in finding who is committing those atrocities. But who would not, I think something that we would expect after when everybody is not yet integrated, when we do have a lot of people who do not have jobs, unemployment is very high. So that's why I say the UN, the international community, the British government should really be aware of this situation and help as much as possible to face and look for solutions.